So welcome to the panel on the, the future of regulatory reporting. I'm Ronan Brennan, I'm the, the moderator today, so we're not here to listen to me. I'm the, I am the Chief Product Officer at CSS, and I think our president earlier got a, a good chance to get the, uh, the pitch in as to who we are and what we do. So with that, I'm going to allow our panelists to introduce themselves today. So we have Patrick Hogan to my left, Michael Kutzia, and then David Leanne at the end. Maybe guys, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and maybe set into context who you work for, your role within that firm, and maybe the context and how it intersects with the future of regulatory reporting before we kick off our discussion. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick Hogan. I work for the uh, European Central Bank, which I joined in 2014 as part of the establishment of the single supervisory mechanism. Uh, my role is involved as part of the management team in our Directorate of Statistics. The Statistics Directorate has uh, two, two roles and responsibilities. First one is standard setter for statistical and monetary data across the Euro area. And secondly, we also provide and collect supervisory data for our colleagues in ECB banking supervision. Uh, in terms of where I see and my view of uh, how RegTech can contribute to uh, the reporting uh, initiatives, I certainly would see and hope that ultimately we get high quality, timely and complete data. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Mike Kutzer. I'm the regulatory controller at Royal Bank of Scotland. I cover liquidity, capital, RWA's leverage, statistical and mortgage type reporting for the bank. I also am responsible for finance data management, um, so a very broad remit. I'm extremely interested in reg tech. It drives what we do. I look at capital in three ways, fungible capital that's on the balance sheet, capital in human resources, and capital in data. Reg tech underpins all three of those, and it really is something we have to embrace and use in the future of our industry. I'll hand up to David. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm David Leanne. I'm uh, Standard Chartered's uh, Group Head of uh, Prudential Reg Reporting. So that covers sort of capital leverage, large exposures and liquidity for the group. Um, I also have a role to play for our regulatory um, change programme. So I tend to be a, a user or an SME uh, for a lot of our change programmes. Uh, and we play an advisory um, consultative leadership role for the various um, uh, global regulatory requirements that Standard Charter has with its global footprint. Excellent. So one of the things I picked up on this morning, uh, whether it's a wave or a tsunami of regulation, there's an awful lot of it. You know, I think we heard you know, some, one, one person talked about mapping out 800 regs and prioritizing 40 of them. But Mike, in a firm like RBS, which has got a very broad range of activities, how do you monitor that horizon, that regulatory horizon, and ensure that you're not missing something really important? Um, it, it, it's a continuum, uh, and I think we used to think of these things as waves. Unfortunately, waves normally happen in a sequence of seven, and they're done. I'm an ex-surfer, and I can tell you, regulation is a lot more than a wave. It is a continuum. If you think of a Moebius strip, it's something that keeps changing. As the regulators change, we have to change. So what we've set up through the firm is, is a more agile approach to looking at regulation as a continuum and across the bank and across all the different levels. The regulation solutions have to deal with things as simple as coots to things as complex as NatWest markets because we look across the whole industry. Um, and so it covers a broad different set of regulations and we bring them together through various forums. Uh, we've moved into a, a more agile, is, is the phrase we use a lot, but it's more of working groups, uh, and small groups, linking across the different areas of the bank. And so those working groups span many operational entities beyond reg or traditional reg and compliance offices? Absolutely. We, we break the silos. So you have business people who are the front line effectively of the customer. You have the operations and technologists. You have the finance people. You have the risk people all grouping together. It used to be when we did Basel II, it was sort of either a risk or a finance program, whichever bank you were in. Now we look at these things as a group of stakeholders across all the disciplines within the bank uh, to get a common outcome. Okay, and David, how, how does that reflect then within standard? Is this, I mean, in terms of how you think about the impact on your architecture, the technology, the, maybe the patterns and principles that you apply, is, do you tend to leverage them as much as you can? Or how, how? Yeah, I, th I think um, my experience is very similar to Mike's in that 
um, the sort of uh, waterfall approach we would have done where um, functions would have hot potatoed regulatory requirements and someone ends up owning it and having to, to wear all the responsibilities, I think uh, increasingly it is seen as a bank-wide um, issue and we work together cross functions uh, and you pull together the right people with the right capabilities to deliver what you need to for the timetable you need to so it's much more iterative yeah. um, uh, much more agile in our in our approach but it's a t it's a tough thing to do right so it rubs against um, uh, some of what historically culturally um, banks like to do and the way in which we like to um, target ourselves and be very scorecard driven and all that kind of stuff Con uh, continuous and iterative change is not uh, an easy sell um, yeah. But it's definitely uh, a more fruitful way of trying to uh, execute some of these requirements. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, Patrick, when you look at it from the regulator's perspective, you're, you're on the opposite side of the fence. You're on the receive, well, the delivery of the, of the bad news in terms of what needs to be reported and how compliance programs need to be structured. But at the same time, you need to deal with all of that flow of information that's coming back in. I mean, how, how do, for, in, for example, in the ECB's case, how do they map out that future path where you're, you're planning to take the industry? Maybe just to pick up on your point yeah. as well uh, about the uh, quantity of uh, regulatory reporting in terms of its diversity yeah. and volume. Uh, it was mentioned 800 uh, uh, pieces of legislation, but if you look in the euro area and particularly what the uh, EC Commission has published since the uh, financial crisis it, crisis, it has pu published 40 major pieces of legislation. If you look across BBRD, CRD2, uh, C, uh, C, uh, CRR, MIFID. So all of those impact on the volume and the range of the reporting the financial institutions mm -hmm. need to contribute to. So what we need to look at is we need to see what's coming down along the line. Mm -hmm. We need to plan what's coming down along the line. And I think as one... Uh, comment this morning from the key panel and speakers is that in terms of the important dates, it's the application date that's the important <laughs> one. And it's, we also look to the application date. Are we ready to receive the information? Have we sufficient infrastructural uh, processes and procedures in place so as that we can collect that information from the right entities? So we ourselves very much look going forward uh, my area of expertise is on the supervisory information in relation to CRR2 and, C and, and CRD. So we're very much looking to what's coming down along the line over the next two to three years from the CRD uh, and CRR2, which has been published in the, next co in the coming weeks. So we are already planning. Now, what that planning means is mm -hmm. that we have to fully understand, has the, has the scope changed? Who has been asked to provide information? Has that changed? And once we identify where those changes are, we then have to build our metadata, our master data, so as that we fully understand that we're collecting the appropriate information in a proportionate way from the right entity. Yeah, I think, so. just taking it further, one of the key things, application data, I totally agree with you, is the key thing where you've got to go live, you've got to meet all the compliance standards. The challenge is actually, but before that as well, from an assessment point, especially with the regulations change your capital requirements, your, your ROE changes, you've got to give that information to the market. We run five-year scenarios for stress testing. So we've almost got to bring all those impacts before we've got final rule sets. And I think one of the challenges where technology plays a helpful hand is the ability to look at multi-options at the same time in terms of the rule outcome. And as you can build that capability, you then build the infrastructure and you're going to get the, the construct through to your metadata. The challenge that, that we face now is, is being a lot more agile and fluid in how you develop because you don't want adjustments in your metadata. If you're giving metadata to your regulator, yeah. they will see layers of adjustments and that causes a concern in your data quality. Yeah. And, and this is the key challenge is we've gone from you know, 10, 15 years ago, we hard-coded systems three, four years in advance and then we laid in adjustments and operational challenges on metadata, yes. which diminished our data quality measures. And that, that is actually what we see the regulators put challenging us, is that metadata quality as the next sort of wave. And that's across all the regimes. Yeah. Um, the other thing we talked about was that there, even though, say, the ECB has been sort of doing direct supervision for approximately five years or so, yeah. 
there still seems to be a quite a diverse range in terms of timeliness and quality depending on the region or the headquarter of the bank and which local NCA it's reporting through. Is that, is there, can you put a finger on why that's happening or not or how, how would you characterise the challenge? <laughs> Because it's surprise, I was surprised when I heard okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the reporting institution, quite challenging. But if we look what's behind the lower quality data from certain institutions and certain jurisdictions, we have to look at we're built, we're collecting using legacy systems across. What the hell are you looking at me when you're talking about? <laughs> <legacy> <laughs> systems, right? I, I was leaning back. <laughs> Uh, we're collecting using legacy systems across, particularly for the ECB and for direct supervision across 19 jurisdictions. So you're looking at 19 different ways in which national competent authorities collected their information from their supervised, from their supervised entities. We, uh, one of the main aims of ECB banking supervision is harmonised supervision and consistency. So what we're striving to do is to introduce harmonised approaches and processes. And I think it was also mentioned this morning, RegTech can also be about processes and procedures as well, not just about technology. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build those harmonised uh, processes and procedures across the 19 different jurisdictions of where the banks are actually headquartered mm -hmm. themselves. We're seeing progress, yeah. but one thing I will say is that we definitely noticed that when we introduce a new requirement, and for anybody familiar with IFRS 9, uh, that's what that was introduced very recently, the quality of the information that we got in in the first of two submissions was pretty poor. But that's not unexpected. In terms of testing, we have no real live data to test it with. So in terms of the procedures and process that we use, our validation rules, our plausibility checks, it's learning as we go by. So. Uh, I would say what we, what we strive to do in the future is for a more harmonised approach in terms of the way we deal with the banks across the SSM and how we implement enforcement actions. I think so. Just uh, uh, one of my sins is our first nine. Yes. Uh, I own that, Joyce. Um, and, and one of the challenges we have within industry is, is we have silos. And earlier when I mentioned getting individuals from the different silos to work together so you get a consistent view of data. So not only is it the legacy construct of your, your old uh, caustic booking system for a loan, it is your more modern trade pricing system. How do you link between the two? So that's a technology challenge that, that, that pervades in most big institutions. And then also where you have multi-jurisdictions, we are a bank of banks of many locations. Um, not that we like calling ourselves a bank of banks. It sounds terrible in the modern age. Um, but when you look at different regulators, there are subtleties, even within European regulators. Um, those of you who are close to points in time is through the cycle credit adjustments. It's a big delta between the PRA and Europe. And the challenge for us as an industry is how do you benchmark and score and assess capital yes. where you've got different rule interpretations in each region, but we've got one customer who wants the best price who operates across all regions. Maybe just to add to that, C certainly that was a challenge that our colleagues in ECB Banking Supervision identified from the establishment of the SSM. And it has taken up until now to have an or a harmonised, as what we call the SHREP approach, that's a supervisory uh, review and assessment process. But I do agree with you. It's different approaches taken at national level. How do you get those into a co coordinated and harmonised way that each bank is treated the same and there's a level playing field yeah. in terms of re regulatory approach? So let's switch it around a bit. In the green room earlier, we spoke about um, something not quite connected to the ECB, Patrick, but rather ESMA, where they're trying to regulate the money market industry. Um, but I guess there is a... IOSCO, the G20, the FSB are promulgating a kind of a thought process that some of the very large money funds are in themselves banks. And what's kind of interesting also, another slight segue is when you see someone like Ant Financial and how they've entered the money market industry in Asia, yeah. and that's a big threat, not just to, to maybe financial stability, but to our industry as we know it, because that this is the, this is the tech world. This is Alibaba entering investment management. Yeah. Um, there is the concept that, you know, 
funds are not banks, but funds at the same time provide huge levels of liquidity. Within ESMA, they're promulgating the Money Market Fund uh, Regulation, which is a quarterly reporting under Article 37, and then public transparency under Article 36. Within the ECB, we've got Money Market Statistical Reporting in terms of trade and, tra trade and transactions in money market instruments. But one thing I've noticed recently is that some of the local NCAs, and I'm thinking more so of the Nordic than anywhere else, have started to gold plate this and starting to drive that reporting well below the Tier 1 banks down to just about every inst every credit institution in the market that's touching off the money markets. Is this a pattern we should see a little bit more of? And then maybe for David and Mike, whether you, you're starting to see the impact of on your, the, the parts of your firm that you would consider the investment management side, whether they're starting, you feel they're being drawn into bank-like regulation or not? I know it's a fairly broad question. <laughs> I'm going to keep my answer quite short <laughs> because I don't speak for ESMA. Yeah. Uh, what I will say is that in terms of the scope of institutions within the ECB's remit is defined by legislation mm -hmm. and we are aware that uh, CRD2 is going to fine-tune that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that scope a little bit to bring into the remit of the ECB large investment firms. So, but in terms of, in terms of money market supervision, I won't comment. Yep, absolutely understand. Uh, I think, so when it comes to things like money market regulations and um, it's actually a lot of the more recent um, reporting stuff, I think something that we look at is how um, some of the public disclosure and reporting requirements are almost informing what you have to do uh, in a secondary manner. So the purpose of a uh, piece of legislation um, and the reporting and disclosure requirements that go with it might not necessarily be the same thing. Um, uh, post the crisis, um, I don't think anyone really had this debate, but the industry very, very quickly lost the debate that more information would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, it's actually an unproven case. No one actually knows if this is true or not. Um, and we'll only know if there's uh, come the next crisis, whether the um, huge amounts of information we pump out actually make a difference or not. Um, I don't tell anyone on my team that, like, the the, the sort of like philosophical question, what's the point of what we're doing, is not one that I want to yeah, <laughs> have yeah. to explain to people. But I think, but it's an it's an it's an, it's, in all honesty, it's an interesting thing to um, to consider, and it's something that we that I think increasingly we need to hold in the forefront of our minds when we are thinking about this. What what use? Um, earlier, my my colleague Marcus was talking about this. Are we about really what the goals and the principles about the the legislations are about, mm -hmm. or are we just about ticking boxes? Um, so are we really trying to protect. Customers, we're really pro trying to protect society, financial market stability, uh, all that good stuff. Or are we just trying to, you know, get through for the day and protect the license and and see the next bit of legislation come down the pipe? I think that that you have to keep those things um, front and foremost when you're trying to meet the, you know, millions of boxes and uh, rows and stuff. Yeah, I think the the key point, sorry, um, just picking up from you there, David, is principles. Um, we we tend to stray away from principles, and actually, that's the tether. You know, we, we have a simple thing called a yes check. Five easy questions, but the one at the blast yes check is in five years' time when you look back at this. Now, unfortunately, I lived through the great financial crisis. It was one of many financial crises. It's just the one we all speak about the most. Mm -hmm. But with all of them, when you look back at them in hindsight, you can go, if only we as an industry had done something different. And, and the difficulty we're trying to do is we're trying to answer the question we haven't been asked by throwing data at people. Yeah. And the problem, that, as you mentioned earlier, Patrick, the data is not comparable. So, so there's a lot of gold in there, but nobody mm -hmm. can get yeah. to it. So how do we change that? And I think one of the key points to your question, Ronan, is, is looking at all the different regulation and looking at how you can build a utility approach and consistency in tool mm -hmm. and data so that you can correspond between the different regulations. Because when I bring everything together, I just have one set of results for RBS. But within that, I've got multiple different institutions and banks, you know, from, from a small trust depository to uh, Royal Bank of Scotland International in Ger mm. Guernsey. Uh, I've got Amsterdam NV. All those different institutions have different rules, but we have to be able to assess them from a performance basis and give that to the investor and inform our investors. And if you look at things from that lens and the customer lens, it's a bit better than the box ticking. Because yeah. uh, I know I wouldn't survive if I was just box ticking form filling. It, it, it's not a great career sell to go sell graduates. Yeah, no, when I've heard objections before, it's been along the line, you know, the, you're, we're, you're, you're trying to regulate for a one in 1,000 event. 
and the quick responses, so a one in every three year event, well that sounds like something we should regulate for. And then the person quickly came back and said, no, one in 10,000 event, and they said, okay, so if our financial system collapses every 30 years, is that an acceptable result for the general democracy? And the answer was clearly not. You know, that, so there are, the reason I guess their burden is heavy is that we are regulating potentially for one in 10,000 events, but that there's a good reason for that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe also just to pick up on, on your point in terms of usage. And certainly I'm in a, in a previous life I was a, a line supervisor as well. And certainly the volume and scope and quantity of information that's available to us is daunting. So you have to decide which is relevant, which gives you a adequate risk assessment of the entity that you're supervising. So if I, was, if I was an institution, I would look and say, are you using all of this? Yeah. The answer is yes, but in different ways. Mm. And what you use for micro potential supervision would be different to what you use for macro potential supervision. So uh, is it being used? The answer is yes. Is it being used correctly? That's an open question. Is the quality of the, of the data that we received fit for purpose? That is definitely an open question, because I can certainly say that the core data that we, that from our experience that we get in terms of capital, in terms of risk-weighted assets, liquidity, NSFR, is of an acceptable standard. But once you go out to the supplementary data, the additional data that allows you to calculate those uh, core information, the quality behind that can be very, very poor. So I asked the question, why are we spending time, resources, and our energy to collect information that is not useful? So it's, to me, it's a mindset change. And it's about how we change the mindset of the reporting entity to say, this is information that, while is useful to the regulator for its narrow focus, should also be useful to us. How can we use that information internally? And I think this was touched upon this morning in one of the speakers as well, about how can we monetize this data in such a way as to provide innovation? I, I think that that is the key, that we as an industry will fail if we do not monetize our data. Mm -hmm. And the only way you monetize anything is through ease of process, consistency, and application. And the challenge for us as an industry that we sort of grapple with, and I spend a lot of time on this with, with um, consultants' houses, is that the threat to our industry, the Ant, the Alibaba, the AWS, it's real. Mm. They're better at data than we are. But we've got the data, yes. and mm. we just need to use it better. Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting. One of the things I don't talk a lot about um, is mortgage reporting. But mortgage reporting drives the interest rate curve in the UK. And if I go to a customer at the branch on the retail side, even my corporate side, and say, if we could do something to improve the interest rate sensitivity, would that be of value? Yeah. Absolutely. To any one of us, something that makes sure that the interest rate decision is based on the best available high quality data. And that comes from an area that very few people look at, which is the sort of mortgage flow in the market. And it's that understanding of the data. That's the bit that we, we as an industry have to do better and more at. So it's interesting now that you've touched on this, Mike, in terms of you know data complexity, and we're going to see an awful lot of growth in that data going forward. It feels like data is doubling, if not quadrupling, on a year-by-year -year basis. Is that driving within your firm an engagement with RegTechs? Is that part of the rationale? And then the second part of the question might be, and, and if so, are you facing into challenges embracing that community or being allowed to embrace that community? I think... Um I'm going to say something here that, that one should never say, but I, I, I'm open about this. It is easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Yeah. But you can't always do that. But one of the key things is if you don't start the engagement with RegTech, you will never get to the table. Yep. If you're not at the table, you can't help. I am a beneficiary of RegTech in the past 18 months. One of my team has been out in the RegTech market very, very actively. And we've brought in three or four applications. We've done at least five POCs mm -hmm. with our technology houses. Uh, in in-house in technology, and it's brought us a lot of benefits. Some of them are not the ones we first thought of, so we're involved with the um, FSA and the FCA ar around um, digital reg reporting. Mm -hmm. All those good things have come from that investment, but I wasn't officially sanctioned to go out and do it. I just said, we need to do this. We 
owns responsibility to the firm and our customer, so we need to engage with those things in the market. Does that mean that I go out and spend 98% of my time with Reg Tech? No, it's literally 2%, yeah. but it, to me it's a very valuable 2% of my time. Being able to have somebody to do that for me has proved invaluable. Yeah. Um, the challenges in a cost-constrained market, which I'm sure David will concur, we are constantly challenged on location and cost. So it's that balance of can you get value and do the seniors in the firm support the value that you're getting? Yeah. And, and that's really where the challenge comes in because yeah. that field is there, but we are caught up in the nearest bushfire <laughs> that we're dealing with yeah. in the next six or nine months. The reg tech development is in the sort of 18 to 24 months. That's where your payback comes through. And you've got to get people on board to support you to do that. Okay, and then David, when we'd spoken, I mean, one thing that struck me was just accessing the right talent in itself was a challenge internally that can face off to, to, to the reg tech industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, I think that a, a fundamental uh, cultural shift is, is um, one that perhaps banks are not traditionally that good at, which is uh, having a bit of humility and understanding <laughs> that, um, that the industry uh, is not uh, all things to all people and is not the, uh, always the smartest person in the room. I think that, um, uh, you know, it depends, depends on what culture, it depends on what bank. Uh, I've worked for investment banks and, and retail banks, and um, they're, all, they're all different. But uh, in, invariably, um, uh, bankers think of themselves as pretty smart guys. Uh, and I think that uh, there's a growing realization that not all capabilities exist within your firm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so um, everyone needs to um, develop and, and upskill, but also um, like draw from outside experience, draw from outside um, uh, places and, and pa partner up. I, th I definitely see the engagement as, as, as a partnership. I think that um, increasingly the um, the model of um, buy it off the shelf and, uh, and stick it in your wardrobe is not what we're looking for. It's much more of a continuous partnership. Um, so uh, at Standard Chartered, um, there's a there's a dedicated arm that um, uh, does uh, investments for reg, uh, for reg tech, for fintech, to try and bring um, small solutions to scale uh, so that we can make use of them, we can make use of them for our clients. Yeah. And, and that's so, part. So, oh, sorry, so, sorry, yeah. I just I think there are two things there that are really key that people... Uh, our industry is changing, our culture is changing. Uh, I've been in the city for 20-odd years, and the changes that are happening every year would have taken five years. And that's not just technology, that's people, behaviours, managing people, engagement with customers, engagement yeah. with the regulators. And it is very much that shift towards a partnership because there are other industries, shock and horror, that do things better, double shock, that we benefit from on a continual basis. Yeah, and absolutely. that's a great step shift, I think, in terms of engagement and career path. No, no, you and me, we know what we're talking about, right? It's just other people need to... Yeah, no, yeah. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> still copying your notes from high school, David. <laughs> Well, what is interesting when we talk about here is that the bank and the FCA have been very progressive in terms of creating an environment that actually gives RegTech a chance to succeed. Like, they've gone out of their way to help. And, and that, I mean, I mean, not, that's not to say, I mean, one thing I know is yeah. the, e the ECB <laughs> yeah. are following a similar vein. It just might not be as well publicized. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think, I mean, in Europe, we're... we're Pretty lucky, like the yeah. um, the 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 regulators. Um, someone made the comment on the previous panel. They absolutely do not want to stifle innovation. They want to partner with it and be yeah. at the forefront of it. Um, I've participated in some of the FCA sandbox stuff, and it's it is um, it's definitely the the way forward. Um, uh, Patrick and Mike are both talking about um, the are we using the data in the right way, mm -hmm. and is it the right quality? And there are. Uh, tools that are yet to be developed that will answer and crack those, crack those difficult nuts. So I think that um, we're, we are very lucky, um, particularly in Europe, uh, but increasingly regulators are waking up to this, right? Because you can't, if you want it, ultimately, if you want it to be a gateway for a prosperous economy, you can't uh, stifle innovation in any way. Yeah. And, uh, sorry. Yeah, I think that the key is also the, the use of innovation in a different way, because you get shown something and you think, I'm just running a reporting process, and we brought in a, a business process management tool recently, that's now spawned across the firm very rapidly because people can see the benefit of visualization. Yeah. When we, we looked at it, I just wanted something to make my Excel spreadsheets work better together. And we've got this alternate hypothesis that is generated, which is three times the benefit we originally thought we were going to get. And, and it's, that's the, the, the benefit of breaking the silos. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's there. So this, it's success is, the success of the early program is driving renewed engagement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. it's interesting. And Patrick, can you share with just because 
there are there's a perception at times maybe that the ECB is a kind of a metaphorically windowless edifice through which it's very difficult to communicate. But there really is a lot of work going on to embrace certainly fintechs and sort of reg tech coming in on its coattails. Maybe if you can share some of that because and maybe dispel some of the myth. Well, in terms of windowless, the the new building is oh, that's completely glass. That's why I said it metaphorically, <laughs> metaphorically um, windowless. <laughs> Uh, there is uh, certainly you want to acknowledge the work that's been done by the Bank of England in terms of putting the uh, reg tech on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, it's something within the ECB we're uh, following very, very carefully. As a matter of fact, we had an in-house uh, conference on uh, fintech and reg tech in very, very recently, and we did invite vendors and various institutions to understand this type of this type of form to understand mm -hmm. what's coming down along the line, but maybe we'll go. I'll go back to a comment again that was that was mentioned this morning. Implementing of regu uh, regulatory regimes is nothing new. Yeah, uh, I think banks have been doing this, and some successfully for decades, some not so successfully, and I think that's where we go into the enforcement. So. I think what we need to look at it is in the evolution. But I want to pick up on, on a point that you make here about we've seen a change, and I, and I can very much agree with you. In my engagement with uh, particularly cross-border banks, they want to understand how they can increase the quality of their regulatory data. They want to understand what more they can do. They want to understand our mechanisms for doing the quality assessment. We, we share that with the banks themselves via our online supervisors, not necessarily in our, you know, in our web page, but through to the bank, through the online supervisor. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have a different way of approaching it, not necessarily in terms of maybe with the Bank of England hold uh, public forums. We certainly do that in our engagement with the bank uh, uh, and through regulatory actions as well. Excellent. So another topic that we covered in our pre-discussion the other day was that the regulator has recognized, or sorry, not their regulator, the regulatory community in itself as a, you know, if you think about the IOSCO level discussions, and there is a move away from prescriptive, what I would call row by column, volume, you know, large volume complex reports to more transactional based reporting. So if we think about, say, and I know again it's an ESMA based regulation, but say SFTR is coming through where for reporting of securities financing transactions. Is that, are we going to see more of that and less of the latter? So we're going to see less of these large, huge forms that firms previously had to complete and rather more focus on the transactional level and the regulator, the banks, or the bank regulators or investment regulators then rolling up the views that they need to create off the transactional data. Should we, exp I mean, I'd like to think that that's where it's going, but is that, have, we, have we reason to be hopeful? Certainly one of the lessons learned from the financial crisis was that the macro uh, data available to mm -hmm. the regulator was not sufficient. And by the, t the time from definition to collection was inordinately long. So if you, if you rolled out a new regulation, it could be anything up to two to three years before the information is being collected. And we've seen what happened in the financial crisis. Yeah. There's also a recognition as well that collecting the aggregate information is not always useful. And that you have to maybe look to more granular information. And in, from, the, from the statistical and, and economic data collection sphere, the ECB is uh, about to roll out its Anacredit project, whereby it will be collecting uh, transactional data, credit registered data. The idea here is that as opposed to defining what you need, rolling it out, and then asking the bank to, to send that in to you, we have the information in-house and we can Drive aggregate yeah, yeah. and drill it which way we want. Yeah. It's, we're only starting with non-financial corporations at the moment, but clearly that's a first sign as, as to where we're going to. And maybe for also very, very briefly to use the opportunity yeah. in terms of the statistical side, we also recognize that there are, there are, are some, or you would say many uh, regulatory reports which are maybe redundant, 
and we're asking the reporting institution to report the information once, twice, and maybe more. So since 2015, the ECB were looking at the integration of data, and not the integration of submitted data, but the integration of data by the bank before it submits to the supervisor. Uh, we have a number of initiatives in place to this. One is the Integrated Regulatory uh, Initiative, uh, whereby we will try to bring together the statistical uh, yeah. data sets of balance sheets, uh, money, market, uh, money market statistics, and then the credit. So again, the idea is that we will get rid of the redundancies and ask the reporting entity to report the information only once. That's, well, that is good news. So, that's fantastic and, uh, news. That's where, uh, that's where the... Uh, and again, you can see that we're going more on the granular level. Now, whether uh, that means transactional or bank level data, it's still uh, not this really cumbersome of uh, defining, rolling out rows, columns, uh, templates. Although, uh, what I wouldn't want to do is trivialize in any way SFTR, because I'm not, yeah, I might be making, because I was going to say, I think it's probably like, one of the reasons SF securities financing transactions were not included in MIFR was simply because they're so much more complex than those traditional transactions. I mean, I just have notes here. There's going to be four different tables, six different reports, 10 action types. I mean, the, the number of trading scenarios that we're going to have to consider is a multiple uh, yeah. that were there in MIFR, and I think the number of data points is double. So I'm not sure the industry's woken up to this. No, I think there's, there are a couple of challenges, just, just on what Patrick just said. Yeah. Part of, of the challenge is how banks operate. We don't look at transactions as individual isolations. They're part of an environment, mm -hmm. and within that environment, I have competitive advantages based on my portfolio, the dispersion, and how we aggregate and operate. And that sp specific nuance I've worked across the industry is different by a bank. At a JP Morgan, you know, th they have huge volumes of transactions. Therefore, their algorithms for doing hedging and macro hedging is different to a smaller bank, which gives them a competitive scale. And the problem is you've got to get these competitive scale outcomes which drive the bank's P&L into your balance sheets, your returns at a group level or even at a bank level. Your transaction reporting mm -hmm. is the base transaction. The SFTR, is a sort of midpoint between them. Yep. So, so how do you link the reverse repo and the repo that yep. you've done when you've got just transaction data spewing out? Yeah, yeah. And that's the trick in SFTR, is creating the loop yep. almost without adding the firm specificity. Yep. And, and this is part of the challenges around reporting, is you represent an outcome, yep. but what you actually want to be showing is, is different degrees of outcome, and some of it will not be publicly transparent because it's inherently what the business does in itself behind closed doors, i.e. what's my hedging strategy on interest rate. I don't publish what that is yep. because that would be telling everybody else how to take a position against me. And uh, people like Ant would love that because they could take a position on where we would be based on their knowledge and that unwind at any bank. So there is that degree of how much information you use, how much information you report, and the challenge we have is SFTR is pitching straight into the middle of that between what we give in transactional reporting yep. and what we give in aggregated macro type reporting. So yeah. it's, it's hugely challenging. Yeah, and the level of enrichment that they're looking for and the data that's, as in there are just fields of information that don't exist in any firm today. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, ba banks don't do things all in one place, um, yeah. particularly large ones. There's no the concept that every single transaction like gets poured into some great big lake somewhere and then we uh, enhance it with it all off. It's yeah. just not how it's just not how it works. Um, I think that um, uh, a move to uh, consistent taxonomy or consistent data hierarchy is prob is probably like the right answer, right? It sounds yeah. like the, the right thing to do. It, it almost, it, at that level, you're almost getting into philosophical debates about whether we should you know, manage and structure data or we should let it let it be free. Yeah. Um, but I think that, uh, but I do think that, that having that is the kind of thing that will drive um, consistency, yeah. uh, which is what we don't have today. No, absolutely. And just the other thing is the quantum of data. When, when I started my career, getting a gigabyte of data was like, wow. Yeah. I, I currently, for IFRS 9, run over 13 terabytes of data on a monthly basis. Yeah. And it's, it's that data quantum, and would I want to be piping that degree of data to a regulator? No. Would the regulator want that degree of data? No. Yeah. And this is the challenge on how you harmonize things to make sure that the outcome of the reporting meets the needs of the users. Yeah. And that has been a challenge since I was a nine-year-old first 
understanding debits and credits. You know, we, we have a huge challenge because of the nature of data and, and how we translate that. Did, did you say you were nine years old when you were doing debits and credits? That's, that's really boring as a nine year old. My grandfather's a bookkeeper. Oh, right. Yeah. Always, always wanted to be an accountant. <laughs> to, to carry on that point, and that is why you need a common identifier. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. A whole different discussion. Yep. Oh, then we could be here for the next day. <laughs> Well, I'm wary that we're running down on the clock. It's like, it's like there's a bomb under the stage. Like, you should see it up there. It goes yeah. like, like orange and then red. <laughs> you didn't watch the bodyguard then, no? <laughs> okay. Um, has, is there anyone who's got a question here? I, it's not often you get a chance to ask the ECB something. Yeah. So, uh, last 10 years saw a huge shift in the regulatory space uh, with MIFID II coming in. Uh, which was a big game changer. Uh, how are we now looking uh, ourselves in the next five to ten years in the regulatory space? In but with respect to what in, we in see in general, like in, in in general regulatory space, how are we sort of like looking in the next five to ten years? Well, what, what, do you want to shoot? Uh, I mean. I Let's guess. answer the question we want to, we wanted to have. What yeah. do you think is going to change in reporting in the next five <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, what's going to happen in MIFID in the next... MIFID or general SFTR or any other upcoming regulations uh, which are coming up. I think, sorry, to, to, to give context, I have a team of 300 people doing regulatory reporting in RBS. We cover such a broad spectrum of reporting that to, uh, I don't even know the answer, and that's not because I'm stupid. It's that there is so much change. Mm -hmm. Every single thing you touch today will be different in five years' time. It will be different through process. Yeah. It'll be different through definition. It'll be different through utilization. Yeah. The shift we're having towards a data-driven organization and a data-driven industry, mm -hmm. both from regulators and customers and investors, is huge. Um, yeah. And that's just impossible to foresee. So yeah. I, I think that I mean, the, the challenge is... I know what I'd like to see is machine-readable regulation that can be interpreted by the, the reg text <laughs> to, to help <laughs> respond in a slightly... Um, but, we're, we can, but there we're have been it. some interesting... It. I know, but that's... Okay, so I thought you were saying no, that it, no, as it was no, a pipe no, dream, no. I was going to say, no, I've seen real world... Yeah, no, I think it's the right, the yeah. right direction, yeah. So, oh, so sorry, I've got a picture of Rafa. The, the toys we're playing with, sorry, and I, I love my toys as much as I berate my technologists because they're always like shining new toys. Um, I'm an accountant by trade, debits and credits give me yeah. away. But I go speak to friends and they say, what's exciting at work? Well, I'm using AI to do in machine readable languages. I've got NLGs and everybody goes, what? I'm getting natural language generators. What? Mm. Don't you guys talk about these things at work? Uh, and they go, Mike, you're an accountant. Yeah, no, it's, when I come across people doing marketing reviews, but with humans, do you, I go, what, why? <laughs> but if I could maybe yeah. just, just add, uh, and just attempting to address your question. Certainly, personal view, I can see a greater degree of integration. And I can see the various regulatory authorities working together to share information, to collect information in a much more integrated way. We've already seen, uh, for example, the use of the data point model across Solvency 2 and, and CRR2. So we've seen a commonality in terms of, of architecture. Can that be applied to transaction reporting? I'm not a technologist, so I don't know. But we're already seeing initiatives here that if we continue at the same pace and if we accelerate it, you will see significant changes in the next five years. There's a question here, and I think it was the lady in green there. Now you said some of my magic words, taxonomy, <laughs> machine readable, uh, all of that, transaction reports. Um, there are efforts now, and there have been efforts uh, in the whole context of this, to classify uh, and list uh, and, and things like the legal entity identifier. Uh, or there's a new one coming out, a unique product identifier. Uh, the um, efforts of the uh, Extensible Business Reporting Language Organization. Um, a universe in which all this data is cleaned, structured, marked, tagged, uh, is, is the future really in tagging? Um, 
in the way you tag things. So you, you all need reports that talk to each other, that are comparable, um, where like equals like, where an entity in one document is the same as an entity in another. Um, is this pure utopia? I think it's beyond pure utopia. It's a necessity. You have to classify and tag your data. If you're not classifying and tagging your data in the industry now, you're too late because already to meet BCBS 239 standards, you've got to be marking data. You've got to be able to see the lineage of data. Um, so we have tools that do data lineage for us. We, we're running an AR logic on data lineage to identify weaknesses and paucity in our data because you've got to be tagging and classifying. And, and once we've got that, I'm sure there will there'll be another generation that AI will show, you could create a differential link. Um, and, and this is what makes the industry really, really exciting. Uh, when I first moved into to regulation, it, it really was just an opportunity that somebody said, you need to go do this. And that was 16 years ago. It's just grown and grown and grown. And that's just the next stage is, is tagging, I think. And just to very, very briefly add to it, as part of the initiative I mentioned earlier about this European Integrated Reporting Initiative, a key component of that is a single data dictionary. So a lot of this work is already ongoing. Yeah. It's on our website, so this is the marketing part. It's on our website to see, to see what work uh, we're actually doing at the moment, but I agree with you 100% that for us to be able to use the data, we have to know we're talking about the same legal entity. We have to know it's at the same consolidated level. And these are, while they, they, while they are straightforward questions, they're actually very challenging to address. Yeah, fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, we've definitely run over our time. But thank you very much, gentlemen. Unless David, so you want to die. Thank you very much for the panel, guys.